It's a good thing. Um, Galatians 5, did you find it? And verse 13. He says, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. By love serve one another. 1 Peter 2, 16. You don't have to turn there. The God's Word translation of 1 Peter 2, 16 says, Live as free people, but don't hide behind your freedom when you do evil. <coughs> You know, a lot of folks uh, have uh, messed up, and if anything's said about it, they go, well, you know, no, don't try to put me under bondage. I'm free. Uh, you're not free so you can sin. That's right. <laughs> don't, don't hide behind your freedom with your mistakes. Use your freedom to do what? To serve God. Galatians had said, by love, serve one another. Well, that is how you serve God, is by serving one another. The Lord doesn't need any money. Hmm? God doesn't need any encouragement. He never gets down. <laughs> Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you don't come boldly to the throne and go, Lord, I need some help. And he says, don't bother me. I don't feel good either. <laughs> that would be bad. But that's never happened. And it never will. He doesn't need help. He doesn't need strengthening. He doesn't need money. He doesn't need encouragement. But his kids do. And when you do it to them, Jesus said, you, you do it to the least of these, my brethren. He said, you did it to me. Uh, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and, and, and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my church? And Saul said, who are you? He's like, what? I don't have anything to you. I don't even know who you are. And Jesus is, is took it personally what he did to the church. Whether it was good or bad, the Lord takes it personally. When you do it for his, you do it for him. And our service to our brothers and sisters is our service to God. And we have been made free so we can serve. In Romans 12, if you look over there. Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans 12 and 1, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In light of the great mercy and grace that the Lord has shown on us, it's just reasonable. That we should serve him by serving each other. Think about it. He saved us. He redeemed us. Our spirit is saved. Our soul is saved. Our mind is saved. Our body is saved. Our finances are saved. Our families are saved. Not just so we can watch TV all day without pain. Not just so we can goof off. And while away our time to no purpose. We are saved to serve. Do you believe it? Yes. You know, we, we when, uh, saw that uh, Peter's mother-in-law was taken with a great fever. She obviously was delirious with fever in a very bad way. And when Jesus came in, they asked him, would he minister to her? And he did. He rebuked the fever, and it left her. And the Bible said she immediately, she got up and ministered to them. That's the best use of a healing you'll ever see, isn't it? She's delirious. I guess she's out of her head. She's near the point of death. And just a few minutes later, she's up, bustling around the house, going, are y'all hungry? 
Let me, fi let me fix you something. And, and, and doing this, and, and nobody said, oh, come on, you're about dead a few minutes ago. Go over there and lay back down. No, that's the way to get back in the same shape. That's right. That's right. We are healed, not so we can just be comfortable sinning, sin without pain. <laughs> We're healed so we can serve. We've been blessed in our finances so we can serve. Say that loud, I've been saved so I can serve. And the truth is, You'll never be happy. You'll never be fulfilled no matter how much stuff you get, how much money or how much success in the world you might have. You will never be happy nor fulfilled until you are doing something that is of genuine benefit for the body of Christ. That's, right. That's, That's where your joy is. Yes, Jesus said that. He said, love one another. As I have loved you. And he said, I said this to you so that your joy would be full. That my joy would be in you and your joy would be full. The selfish life is the miserable life. It's the unhappy life. But the giving life is the fulfilling life. Can you say glory to God? Uh, go with me. Over to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, please. 1 Corinthians. Well, let's say I'm moving too quickly. You in a big rush this morning? Yes, sir. Ephesians 4, let's go there first. Ephesians 4, we touched on this before, but I want us to look and emphasize a a specific part of this passage. Ephesians 4. We asked the question in previous sessions, and if you haven't been with us, these are available. You can go back to the Word Supply and get a, a DVD or CD of the previous messages. You can go online on the internet, download all of it in its entirety for free. It won't cost you anything. We've already covered a lot of ground. And one of the things that we asked the question and talked about is, who is supposed to do the work of the ministry. Who is supposed to do the work of the ministry? Well, common idea and concept is that the ministers are supposed to do the work of the ministry, that being the preachers. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, they're the ministers, so it sound log sounds logical that they should do the work of the ministry. Ministers do the work of the ministry. But that is not true. That is not what the Bible teaches. It is not the plan of God that the ministers do the work of the ministry. Now we, we, we saw, and it's talked about mind renewal, when you hear the word ministry, what should you think? Service. Service. And when you hear the word service or ministry, what else should you think? Worship. Worship. First Corinthians 12 talks, I mean, excuse me, Romans 12, 1 talks about that. And if that sounds new to you, again, go, go back to previous sessions, get the materials. We spent a lot of time on it. But the, in the NIV, in verse 11 here, Ephesians 4, 11, NIV. Jesus gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Why did he give them? Verse 12, their job is to prepare God's people for works of service. The King James says, for the work of the ministry. Who's supposed to do the work of the ministry? The saints, all of God's people. Not the five-fold ministry gifts. Their job is to get the people ready and prepared and equipped to do the work of the ministry. Let me read some other translations of this. The Amplified says it like this. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints that they should do the work of ministering toward building up 
Christ's body, the church. The ultimate goal is to build up the entire church, the entire body of Christ, to be built out, built up. Built in the sense of becoming bigger and built up in the sense of becoming stronger. Everybody say bigger, bigger. And, stronger. and stronger. We're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about the church. And who are the people that are to do this? Preachers. Huh? No. But that is widely believed. That that is predominantly the job of the preachers. But it is too big a job for a handful of preachers to ever touch. And it is a sad account of affairs that so many churches, they got a, a, a preacher uh, or, or the husband and wife team or a couple of staff or a handful of staff and, and everybody in the church thinks it's their job to do the spiritual stuff, all the praying and, and the believing and the counseling and the visitation and the preparing and studying and the preaching and, and all that and pre pretty much the voice and witness of God to the community and everything while they do what? <laughs> while they come and sit and listen and then go home and then come back and sit when they can. <laughs> this is not right. This is not Bible. This is not the plan of God. This can never get the job done. It's too big. This thing is big. This harvest field all over the earth is big. The church of God, the body of Christ is big. There is much to be done. What did Jesus say? The harvest is great. And the workers? Workers? are few. A lot of folks have developed an aversion to work. It's nigh on an epidemic <laughs> of non-working people. <laughs> well, we're having fun now, aren't we? <laughs> But working, uh, all of us doing the work of the ministry was God's idea. Amen. Work has been, you know, this kind of work has been God's plan. God's idea. Say it out loud. Work. Work. It's God's idea. It's God's idea. <laughs> and it's good. It is. Now there's some effort involved in it, but it, you can enjoy it too. Good work. It's enjoyable, especially when you see the fruits. You see, see the results. Who's supposed to do the work of the ministry? The saints, everybody, all of God's people. And the ministers are given to prepare the people and, and equip the people. The easy to read says to prepare God's holy people for the work of serving, to make the body of Christ stronger. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 3 now. 1 Corinthians 3. In 1 Corinthians 3, he's talking about this very thing. He says in verse uh, 7, Neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. God is not a God of decrease. He's not a God of you staying where you are. He's a God of increase, bigger, better, further, more, stronger. Increase. Say it out loud. God's will is increase. 
What about for 2012? Increase. Increase. Say it out loud. I'm not going down. I'm not going back. I'm not staying where I am. I'm increasing. I'm increasing. What kind of year is 2012? It's, you know, I can't speak for everybody. <laughs> but for me and my house, I'm looking at my house. Huh? You are my house. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to increase, 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 increase in every good thing. Break out on the left. Break out on the right. Move forward. Move up. Look out. Here we come. On the increase. Verse 9. For we are what? Now what's a laborer? Worker. Labor means work. W-O-R-A-K. <laughs> I know they don't say it like that in Arkansas, but in some places they do. Work. Come on, everybody say it out loud. Work, work, work. 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 Whose idea was work? God's. God's idea. God's plan. Work. We are laborers, workers together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. And then he, then he goes into detail talking about building this building. What building is he talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about the church. Verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given to me, Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Thank God he did. I mean, we're reading out of these letters. This is foundation that was laid centuries ago. And we're building on this. I have... I have uh, laid the foundation and another builds their own or builds on it. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Keep going, verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, that's, that he laid, that they've already been laid. And that, that foundation is Jesus Christ. That's right. Hallelujah. Verse 12. If any man build on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, Every man's work, work. Now, I don't, are you reading the same Bible with me here? Uh, verse 8 says labor. Verse 9, laborers, building. Build, verse 10, building, building, building. Uh, verse 12, uh, building. Verse 13, work, and then work again. Verse 14, work. Verse 15, work, 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 work. work. What a revelation. <laughs> Work. <laughs> if any man's work shall be burned, he'll suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. Work. Work. We're working on the same building Paul worked on. We're on a different floor. <laughs> There's been laying floors on that foundation and building up for century after century. And now we're working on, you know, the 100,000th floor or whatever it is. But we're not supposed to be goofing off. We're supposed to be working on this floor because we only got a short amount of time to do this before we're out of here. And then if the Lord tears is coming further, there's another generation will be in laying a floor on top of ours. I think we've got to be getting close to the top. What do you think? Go 
to Ephesians. This doing anything for you today? Stirs me up. Ephesians 2. Remember the old song, Working on a Building? Working on a building. <laughs> Working. That being the key word. Work. King. <laughs> Ephesians 2. And verse 19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We were Gentiles. Heathen outside the covenants of God, but now the Spirit of God, the Spirit of adoption, is in our hearts causing us to cry, Abba, Father. He's just as much my Father as He was Abraham's. Is that right? Everybody that's been born again. And verse 20, and we are built. Upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Verse 22. In whom, well verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth. Now you'll see a word called edify in the New Testament. Edify, edification, edifying. And that's not a word we use so much in modern vernacular, but it, the same uh, word is translated building, like a physical building in the New Testament. Exact same Greek word that's translated edifying or edifica edification, I should say. Is translated building, referring to a physical building. And it literally means to build or to build up. An edifice is a structure, especially an imposing one, that rises up and goes up. And this is referring to the greatest building ever built. All the building is fitly framed together and it's doing what? It's growing. It's growing. Oh, I don't think you heard that. You know what it's built out of? It's not built out of lumber and nails or cinder block or plaster. It's built out of souls. It's built out of living stones sealed in place by the Holy Spirit. I'm one of them. You're one of them. We are a living stone in this structure. Anytime you see lost people, you ought to think, building materials. Yeah. <laughs> Build, building, we got to get this thing built. The more people save, that's the more materials. We got to finish out our floor. Amen. This building fitly, perfectly Fitting, how many know the Holy Spirit know, knows exactly who goes where in the building? What spot you fit in and who fits next to you and behind you and in front of you and around you? It's not by accident where you were born and where you grew up and why you think the way you do and how you wind up in Branson, Missouri on a Sunday morning. And who's in your life and who's your friends and who's your family, particularly your family in God. That's where you have been sealed into the building. And he said, the building fitly framed together grows unto a what? A holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. 
I was telling some of the guys uh, earlier down in the building in Florida, it's, it's looking like a church. It's looking like a church. I said, yeah, but that's not a church. When the people come, <laughs> they are the church. It's just a physical structure we can use temporarily. Thank God for it. But God does not dwell in buildings made by men's hands, mortar, brick, lumber, structure. We are. We are the temple of God. This is, this is reality. We are the temple of God. And this structure has been being built since the foundation was laid all those centuries ago. And it's coming up, 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 up. And soon and very soon, the last stone is going to be sealed into place. And this thing's going to be finished. And God is moving in with his fullness into his holy temple forever. So shall we ever be with him. Him and us, us and Him. Can you say glory to God? Right here, right now, what's our job? Work on this building. Somebody say work on the building. What's your part? What's my part? Working on the building. Go with me to the book of Titus. Do you think it would be a privilege to be an assistant's assistant to the assistant holding the water jug yes, if you got to work on this building? Yes, sir. Huh? Would it be tremendous honor and privilege to be able to do anything that contributed in any way? Why? Because when this, this whole planet, everything that's on the surface is gone and forgotten millennia from now. This building will stand and never go away and never fade, never falter, never fall. And so anybody who did anything to work on this building will be remembered forever. <laughs> I don't know if God gives tours of his house later on, but you're on the hundred and... 20,000th floor and you're coming through this part. Who built that? Who did that? Who brought that? Who, who was in, integral to that? And somewhere along through there is the Branson Faith Life Church Bunch. Yes. <laughs> and the part that they did. It's huge. It's big. It's big, 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 big. Talk in tongues and can't tell it big. But to have any part, to have any part in it, it's huge, huge. In Titus, the third chapter and the 14th verse, Spirit of God through Paul said, let ours learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. The complete English version says they need to spend their time doing something useful and worthwhile. The Dewey translation says, let ours learn to excel in good works. Excel in good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. You're, you're going to hear that word excel again. The Lord gave me that word. I'm learning more about it. When this church first began, we had a Friday night service and then we had the first Sunday service and, you know, things began to go. The Lord dealt with me about that Friday night service, praying about it. He spoke to my heart. I don't mean I heard a voice, but inside me. He said he was going to bring people here on that service. He's going to bring ministers here and others here and, and they would be weary, some of them, and they would be worn but they were going to be refreshed and renewed in these services. He was going to do it. Thank you, Lord. Well, that's useful. That's helpful. 
That's fruitful. That's productive. And uh, he, he dealt with us that we were to excel in hospitality. That's the phrase he gave me. Excel in hospitality. And now I'm getting more light on it reading these verses because this word excel comes up more than once. And do you know what it means? Have you ever looked this word excel up? It means to super abound. To super abound. That sounds like way more than what's adequate or required. Does that sound like above and beyond what's necessary? Excel. Excel in what? In good works. For necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Go to the second chapter. You're in Titus. So just go back to the second chapter now and also the 14th verse. That was 314. This is, uh, excuse me, that was, yeah, 314. This is 214. And it says this, and this is a summary of everything that we have uh, been seeing in all these other verses. Sounds the same. That the Lord gave himself for us. That we might, that he might rather, redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, what? Zealous, Zealous of good works. Zealous. What does zealous mean? What is a zealot? A zealot is not a bored, idle individual. Huh? Who, what kind of person is a zealot? Whatever they're a zealot for. What are they? They're hyper. They're, right? They're, they're pumped. They're, that's what they want to talk about. That's what they want to do. They, they just want to go over and above and beyond. Super abound in whatever they're zealous about. Somebody said, well, I like that thing. It's okay, but man, they're just a zealot about it. Well, here's something it's okay to be a zealot about. Zealous of what? Good works. Zealous of good works. Let me read, let's read this in the Amplified. It said, the Lord gave himself on our behalf that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purify for himself a people, a people who are what? Eager and enthusiastic about living a life that's good and filled with beneficial deeds, good works. Eager and enthusiastic about good works. Say it out loud, eager, eager. and enthusiastic, enthusiastic. About, good works. about good works. Whatever you are zealous about says volumes about who you are. It's okay to enjoy some things and be involved in some things that you find fun or entertaining or relaxing or whatever. But you should not get more excited about cars than you do building the kingdom. You should not get more excited about football. Or golf. That's right. Or fishing. Amen. Then you do. Building the kingdom. Right? right? And I'm not talking about trying to be goody goody. Holy holy. Saying some things that you don't really mean. I mean being genuinely. Excited. Right. Zealous. Enthusiastic. About doing some good stuff. That helps people. You ought to get more excited about that than anything else. Do you believe it? That's why God saved us. That's why he redeemed us. That's why he healed us. That's why he cleaned us up. That's why he's getting us out of debt and paying off our bills and putting money in our pocket and healing our bodies. Why? Not so we can shout more over shopping than we do him. Not so we can get more excited about building our house. And what we're going to pick out and the color of our drapes. and So that shows carnality. Not realizing all this stuff 
is about to be gone. I mean, it is so temporary, it is so fleeting. Not to say you can't have something, not to say you can't enjoy something, but it needs to be way down on the list of what you really get excited about. What excites you? The older I get, the further I go, the more I learn. What excites me is advancing the kingdom. Which is the same thing as saying building the building. Doing something that's going to push the devil out of the way and be an opportunity for people to come in. Come on. For people in darkness to hear the word and get light and get free. People entangled in devilish uh, tradition of men holding, blinding them, holding them back to break free, to come out, to quit believing lies, to get saved, to get free, to get filled, to get thrilled, to get healed. There are people hurting, and God wants to show them how much he loves them. He wants to just come into their life and blow the darkness and depression and fear and junk to smithereens. Tell me what the anointing does. It removes the burdens. It destroys. Picture explosion. Destroys yokes. That's what he wants to do. Can you get excited about that? Yeah. And you don't have to be a preacher. And you don't have to spend all day praying. You don't have to spend, you know, all day quoting scriptures. It can be some of the smallest things, naturally, that God can show his love through. But you want to be doing something. Don't you? I said you want to be doing something. Not nothing. Not just waiting while days and years of your life click by. You, there's something you can do. How many think it'd be a privilege if you just were the second assistant to the assistant who held the water jug? Yes. If, if you're working on this building, that's a more illustrious position than anything in this natural world that'll never be remembered a thousand years from now. Isn't it? There's something you can do. Something that is beneficial. Something that is helpful. That the word help has to do with the idea of supporting and strengthening, but also the idea of relieving. You know, if somebody's got, you know, if they're overloaded because all these folks are not doing their job, if somebody just starts doing something, it takes, it takes it off of them. Their load is lighter. Many hands make the work light. Doesn't it? Many hands make the work light. And that's what this is about. If all the saints are doing the work of the ministry, instead of people, a handful of ministers being burdened and overloaded, we've got ministers that are just breaking and, and old before their time and just because they're trying to do all this stuff that they were never supposed to do. They're doing other people's jobs and not doing their job well. And at the same time, people are bored and idle and they're not going to get any reward. It's not the plan of God. No, but man, if you've got everybody in their place Amen. and everybody doing their job, Amen. nobody's overloaded. No. It's fun. It gets done quickly. It gets done easily. And everybody's going to get reward. Yes. Everybody's going to be a part of this eternal reward. Go with me, if you would, over to, uh, let's see, 2 Thessalonians, I believe it is. We'll actually go to 1 Corinthians 14 first. Then we'll go there. 1 Corinthians 14. First Corinthians 14. Can you take some more? 14. And uh, two. Well, let's just start in verse one. Follow after love. Now, let me just just stop right here. Do you, 
the eighth chapter and the first verse, the last phrase says, love edifies. What does love do? It, it had said, knowledge puffs up, charity edifies, which means builds up. Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. That's 1 Corinthians 8.1. What does knowledge do? You think you know a lot of stuff. All that does is puff you up. But if it's really the love of God, and God is love, if it's really God, it's not just going to puff you up, it's going to build somebody up. Say it out loud, knowledge, knowledge. Puffs, up. puffs up. Love, love. Builds, up. builds up. In the... Uh, uh, first, chapter, first verse here, it says, follow after this love, this love that builds up, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Let's read a couple of verses here. For he that speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. No man understands him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks unto men to what? Edification, Edification building up and exhortation and comfort, would all that be help? You're built up, you're comforted, you're encouraged, you're strengthened. If, that's, if, if, if a child of God, a brother or sister, is genuinely built up, comforted, encouraged, and you are involved in them getting built up, you're working on the building. We're either adding on to it, making it bigger, or we're in reinforcing it, making it stronger. We need new parts to come in to make it bigger. But then the parts that are already here, they need to be strengthened, made stronger. So they stay in place and do their job. Verse 4, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, what does he do? He builds up himself. But he that prophesies, he does what? Edifies. He builds up the church. You see, he's drawing a difference here. The difference between building up yourself or building up the church. And these guys needed some correction because all they were focusing on was building up their self. They're having spiritual experiences. They're, they have gifts of the Spirit. They speak in tongues. They prophesy. They this, they that. And so they're coming in and interrupting the service and interrupting the flow because they get an urge to speak in tongues and they just let her rip and there's no interpretation and nobody knows what's going on and there's confusion. And he's telling them by the Spirit of God, speaking in tongues is wonderful. I would that all of you spoke in tongues. I speak in tongues more than all of you, which is saying a lot. But in the church... You need to do this with the mindset of who's being helped by what I'm doing. Major mind renewal here. So important. Keep, keep, keep reading here. Verse 5, I would that you spoke with tongues, but rather that you prophesied, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues, except he interpret in order that what? That the church may receive edifying or building up. Skip down to verse 12. Verse 12. Even so, you, as much as you are what? Zealous of spiritual gifts. Now, what are the other verse we, we got through reading? It said we ought to be zealous of what? Good works, works that benefited our brother. He said the same thing. You're zealous of spiritual gifts. That's great. He's not telling them they can't be. But seek that you may excel, excel, superabound, to the edifying building up of the church. Excel to the edifying of the church. Excel to the edifying of the church. That's our mandate. That's our call. Excel. Uh, verse 26. 
What is it then, brothers? I'm reading the W-E-B, so whatever, just King James, you can leave it up there. When you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has another language, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying, or this translation says, done to build each other up. There is a deception and a, a straying off path and an error that so many have gotten into. And that is, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to have gifts. And some people tend towards a, a monastic bent of I'm going to pull away from the world and get away from everything and everybody and I'm going to pray everything through, and I'm going to believe everything through, and I'm going to have all the... Who is it helping? Amen. If it's not helping somebody genuinely, you're kidding yourself. You're not more spiritual than Paul. You're not more spiritual than Jesus. Jesus didn't close up and take a vow of poverty. And never stick his nose out. Of his hole. He ate with sinners. He rubbed elbows. Didn't he? Didn't he? And what he did. It was as spiritual as it gets. It was as high and as deep. And as profound as it gets. And yet. The simplest, most uneducated farmer and fisher understood exactly what he was talking about and it helped them. I said it helped them. It helped them in their life and with their kids and with their job. It helped them get rid of their fear and their condemnation. It helped them get healed and delivered. See, he's drawing a contrast between just edifying yourself or edifying the church. And if you're a baby and carnal, all you're going to think about is what edifies me. But if you grow up and you become like the master, then you, your, your life begins to take on a different focus. And you don't just get up thinking about what I need. And what I want to experience. You get up with a mindset of here am I Lord. Send me. Use me to help somebody today. And you will find that the selfish and self-centered life is the miserable life. I don't care how much revelation you think you get. And how many scriptures you can quote. And how many hours you prayed in tongues. If it's not helping anybody. You're going to be empty and unfulfilled. The Bible said some tongues is like banging gong and clanging cymbal. Empty. Nothing to it. But if, if it's God. If it's the love of God and the faith of God. It's helping somebody. I said it's helping somebody. It's building up the body of Christ. The Bible said be zealous about that. Hmm? Look around, see if you can detect any enthusiasm <laughs> of the people round about you, in front of you, or behind you. Any eagerness or enthusiasm to get out there and do some good works that's going to help somebody. Can, can you detect... Well, if there's not enough of that, part of that's my job. Yes, it is. The gifts are given, aren't they? Yes. To equip the saints yes. to do the work of the ministry. And that's what I'm waving my hands and hollering and, and carrying on right now. <laughs> trying to do my job. <laughs> not trying, doing by the grace of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Go with me. To uh, Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and now we're nearing a closing place here. Second Thessalonians. We saw in First Corinthians three a whole lot about work 
work, 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 work. <laughs> and I want to remind you of something that the Spirit of God said through Paul. I, just in reading it again, I can tell so much of the church has not taken this seriously. Don't, I, I think a lot of Christians really don't even agree with this. And that's not good. Because it is the New Testament. Let's read it and you see what I'm talking about. 2 Thessalonians 3 and 6. I'm reading the NIV. 3, 6, NIV. The Spirit of God said through Paul, In the name of the Lord Jesus, we command you, brothers. That's strong, isn't it? To, to do what? Keep away from every brother who is idle. Who is what? Idle. Idle, <laughs> idle as in non-working. <laughs> to do what? Away. Stay away from them. Yes, sir. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> you see some of the looks. You can see how traditional folks are instead of the Word of God. Because people think, well, that don't sound very Christian to me. Oh, you're more Christian than the New Testament. <laughs> Keep away from every brother. Did you know actually that's love? Because somebody that is off does not need to be included in everything as though everything is all right. They need something to help them wake up to how far off they are. At the end of this passage, he said, don't treat him like an enemy, but warn him like a brother. Uh, keep away from every brother who's idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Now, do you, do you consider Paul a spiritual man? Yes, sir. Do you? Yes. No question about it. But I want you to notice what he emphasized. We were not idle when we were with you. If he wasn't idle, what did he do? He worked. He worked. Verse 8. Nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. We did not live off of any of you. We did not mooch off of you. We paid our own way. He said, I paid my own way. We worked. We worked. Night and day. Laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. He said, we worked. Verse 9, we did this not because we don't have a right to such help. In other words, he said, as your minister, I had a right to be supported by you. But this was in the early days of their association. And he said, I wanted to do this to make for an example, to show you how you're supposed to operate. Make ourselves a model for you to follow. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. Well, Brother Keith, everybody deserves to eat. Apparently not. <laughs> Now see, you, you're going to go with your sense your, of sensibility, your own version of Christianity, or are you going to go with the New Testament? Verse 11, we hear that some among you are idle. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. The, the Amplified says they're busy with other people's affairs instead of with their own. And they're doing no work. <laughs> Verse 12, 
Such people we command. That this is the NIV. I'm back to the NIV. Uh, such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn or, or work for the bread that they eat. You know, we, we've got too many folks that are claiming to live by faith. And their finances are a disaster. And yet they continue. Week after week and month after month. To pull on others. And won't work. This is not okay. We should work. This working involves every area. Why? Because if we're doing our part. Other people are relieved. Right? If we're covering our stuff, then that's something they don't have to think about. And even if you're, you're flipping burgers or you're stocking a grocery shelf or you're, whatever you're doing, you tithe off it, it becomes to take on kingdom significance. And you're feeding yourself and you're taking care of it. This is significant. This is important. But to lay around and do nothing because you got a ministry and God's called you and God's told you that he's going to do this and he's going to do that. And yet week after week and month after month, you're just going in the hole, going in the hole, going in the hole. Your family's suffering. Your kids are suffering. Something's not right. If the Lord tells you to do something, he really told you, your needs will be met. If your needs are not being met, then he either didn't tell you, Or you got it mixed up some way. Maybe you're sincere, but you misinterpreted some things. You jumped to some conclusions. Anybody can make a mistake. But when you realize that month after month your needs are not being met, don't just keep being idle and doing nothing. Get you a job, any kind of job, until you figure it out. Are y'all with me, friends? This is Bible, isn't it? This is Bible. And don't say, well, I, you know, I'm overqualified for that. <laughs> That's not what I'm looking for. Nobody said you had to do that the rest of your life, but do something. Yes. Do something instead of, of violate plain scripture. Because the Bible said if you don't work, you should not eat. On the other end of this now, if you're financing somebody's idleness, you are contrary to the scriptures as well. So, no, don't let condemnation harass you and bother you. Just be willing to make adjustments. Right? Amen. Be teachable. I, I, some years ago, a person told me, kind of annoyed about this, kind of talking along these lines. They said, well, you don't work. You don't work a job. <laughs> that's not true. I said, that's not true. Just an example of the, these few days. I, um, I came up here uh, Friday, did the pre-flight, did the planning, did the flying, uh, prayed and studied for hours and preached on Friday and here we are, preached already once today. I'm going to do all the planning and the flying. I'm going to Fort Worth this evening. We'll tape uh, all morning and then the next morning I'll fly back here. I'll be ready for you on, on Friday. If I wasn't doing my job, I shouldn't eat either. Are y'all with me now? I'm not complaining. I like what I do. I enjoy my job, but it is work. You got to do a lot of things that your flesh doesn't want to do. And there's been times that I've come in and kind of plopped down, and I'd like to take a big nap, but uh, I got to speak to you in a few hours. <laughs> and I don't want to just get up and, and do nothing. I want to hear from him. I want to have the word. I, I want it to be right. So uh, sometimes you got to stir yourself up, and, and, and it, it takes time, and it takes effort. It's work. And maybe that's not your work, but there is work you can do. 
And there is work you should, nobody should just be idle and do nothing and do nothing and do nothing and mooch off of others and, and pull on others. Yeah. Right? right? And again, if you've made mistakes, we're not talking about getting under condemnation. We're just talking about making a change. Amen. Make, make the change. Amen. Make the change. And uh, maybe some of the things that you thought you were hearing from the Lord... Maybe part of it is right, and in time to come, you'll see how it fit together. And You know, sometimes uh, people heard right, they just got way off on the timing. Try to do something way too soon or too early or in the wrong time or place. But it's real simple. If your needs are not being met, get a job. Any kind of decent, honest job. Right? It's honorable. To work. They don't come any more spiritual than Paul. And he said, we worked. I gave you an example. I worked. I didn't mooch off of anybody. I, I paid for all, everything I used. We worked. And that kind of mentality, if you get into that in the natural way, it flows over into the spiritual as well. And if you're faithful in a small thing, God will add to you. My ministry began by straightening up chairs and 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 of stacking books and, and filling out information forms on folks. It didn't start by building new churches in another part of the country. Are y'all with me? And if, you, if you'll be diligent, and that might have seemed like a very, very small thing. Well, if the chairs need straightening, they need straightening. And if you're working on this big building, chair straightening on the kingdom building, you ought to be zealous about it. You ought to be enthusiastic about it. You ought to be eager about it. I mean, if the body of Christ really understood this, they'd be showing up every day going, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me hold that broom. Let, let me move that. Let me take that trash can. Let me, anything that's associated with building this building is eternal. Can you say glory to God? Stand on your feet, everybody. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead.